Hello, it's Scott Manley here with part 12 of Galileo Conquest, and as... Well, wait a second, we have another pair of mm -hmm. tours? No, 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 we don't care about that. We want the Space Hotel contract. That's right, we have a Space Hotel that is required with a capacity for 50 kerbals! And lots of electricity and lots of transmitters, but most importantly, lots of kerbals and 350 kilometers above the surface of Kerbin, so they will have a fantastic view from up there, no doubt. For that, we will get 600,000 funds and some, uh, you know, prestige. But before all that, we do have an upcoming transfer window to one of the inner planets. And so we bring forth a new spacecraft. Yes, speed three. Known because it needs to go fast. Faster than three miles per hour. And it will in fact have to slow down, hopefully, to get into orbit. This uh, should have more than enough with all its various multitudes of stages. But unfortunately, during launch... Oh no! What? Wait, 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 what is imminent failure of AVR-8? Wait, wait, we had another winglet fail. What is it with winglets failing during launch? Yeah, second random failure is another winglet, and we don't really care about that because we have a pretty good rocket, pretty good control systems, even a very nice stage separation of those boosters there. It almost looked like a professionally designed vehicle. Now you'll note that when it started on the pad, it had a delta V of about uh, 7,000. Now it's almost up to uh, over 11,000. So. This has plenty of Delta V to get down to the closest planet, and that's where we're going. We are trying to get to Icarus, the planet that spends too much time close to the sun. Well, that's an original name. I hope they haven't made it of wax and feathers because, well, it'd be nice to not sink into a lake of wax when I land. There's the upper stage here. We still have fuel in that main rocket, but we can ditch the fairing. Look at it, we have this, um... We have this strut which appears to be hanging out the side of the rocket. Not sure what that's doing, but we shall leave its kind behind as soon as possible. We we don't like seeing that kind of thing. We of course have some solar panels to keep the thing powered during its long journey down, and they don't care about that strut either. They're just saying, yep, yeah, strut, we don't care. Communitron opens up, and now it actually really does look like a space probe. So yeah, getting down to the nearest planet and getting to orbit probably takes more Delta V than anything else you're going to have to do. At least if we're ignoring launching from certain super high mass planets. Building this out took a lot of optimization to get just the right levels of, of masses, the mass ratios for each stage, and to find engines that were sufficiently efficient that we could, uh, we could actually make use of them. So yeah, down towards Icarus, closest planet to the sun in this universe, and that is, well, it takes 2.75 kilometers per second to get down to there. But of course, then we're going to need to make inclination corrections, we're going to have to slow the orbit, and we are going to have to perform a capture. And hopefully, we can do that. This thing is a very highly instrumented vehicle. We have... Uh, both types of surface scanners we have and of course every other kind of reusable scientific instrument that we can, we can use to collect data from this as yet unexplored planet. Now if you remember I haven't actually looked at any of these planets so I don't know what I'm gonna need but I'm hoping that I can get into orbit. If it has too much gravity maybe we will be unable to do it but we'll we'll figure it out once we get in once we get close then we'll maybe send another mission now the acceleration of this upper stage isn't quite as high as that of the lower stage which meant that we uh, it meant that we we're taking a lot longer to get to perform this escape burn and that is going to have a knock-on consequence because it means that it uh, the, the orbit is going to curve up higher than we expected due to the curve due to the fact that uh, Gale is there pulling the orbit around, so when we get down there, it may not be in the configuration that we wanted. So we're going to have to work on this a little more, but hopefully 
everything will work out and we will at least get a fly past. We'll definitely be able to get a fly past. The real question is, will we be able to get into some sort of stable orbit? But there we go. Look at us. We're all over five kilometers per second we, we needed to get to escape and fall down towards Icarus. We have our orbit plotted in. We're going to set up our alarm clock so that we have our maneuver set up. That's the first maneuver which is going to correct the inclination. And then we can get back to that space hotel. Yes, the field is one of the premier venues on Craggy Island, and so I thought the hotel needed to take that name. So, yeah, it does fit inside that fairing. Hopefully this thing will not flip out and go crazy. Oh, uh, I think I have forgotten to put struts on here. Oh, 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 um, okay, that is not good. We have, uh, no, wait a second, we might... We might not be able to get into orbit right now. Total delta V is 2.1 kilometers per second, and uh, yeah, okay. Well, the good news is that we haven't flipped out and lost control because of that asymmetric thrust. We can't shut down that engine, so we might as well just keep going. I, I think even if I could soft land this, I, I don't think it would immediately fall over and explode. So let's just go for it now. Like. Let's just concentrate on the gravity turn. So, I think I'm going to try and loft it a bit because the second stage engine is designed to burn for three minutes. So, we need to make sure that we don't lose, we don't fall back in while that's still burning. Time to say farewell to our one faithful booster. Thanks! We like you more than your brother. Okay, so the good news is, although we. Yeah, we got 1.8 kilometers per second, and we definitely, when we count gravity losses, we're going to be in trouble. But I think we have, we've probably got excess mass on the second stage we can ditch, like monopropellant. Uh, we could probably ditch the life support since there's no crew on board. So, I'm not going to write this off just yet, but prepare for the worst. <laughs> Thing I launched this uncrewed. 700 meters per second. We have uh, about 20 seconds worth of fuel left. Now we're really just picking up sideways velocity here. Uh, by the time this burns out, we should have about a minute 30 to apple apps. Maybe not even that. Okay, here we go. Six, five, four, three, two, one. Get ready to stage. Bingo. Stage. Fire that engine. Okay, fight things to ditch. Uh, we know we have some monoprop there, a stupidly small amount of monoprop. And life support tank, 15,000 supplies. I have no idea how much that massed, but it seems to have pushed my Delta V up to but 1,200, which, if we count gravity losses, should get us there. Oh my god, this is going to be so tight. This is, this is The margin for error here is small. And we have monoprop in that middle tank there, that service module, but we can't ditch it. The jettison function jettisons everything, and we still have fuel in it. But we can pump the fuel backwards. There we go. As soon as that's empty, we can ditch that monoprop, and that should give us a little boost. Delta V remaining is getting down close. Let's just watch this. Bingo! I don't know, I didn't even see. I think we might have gained a little. But I think we've ditched everything we can, I'm not sure. I think we've I think we can. Okay. So Apple Apps is now getting close to 70. We just need to have something that's one kilometer outside the well, not even that. We just need to be outside the atmosphere. Otherwise the orbit will inexorably decay and this giant investment will be lost. Okay. 40 seconds to Apple Apps and uh, about two minutes, just over two minutes, 10 seconds out of fuel. So we need to we need to keep angling this up so that we basically run out of, or we, we get it to circular orbit. We, we don't wanna, we, we gotta provide some vertical thrust here. Okay, we're about to leave the atmosphere and that means that drag will no longer be a drag on me. 
Uh, yeah, incidentally, I don't know, <laughs> I should have mentioned this earlier, these are all inflatable modules, that's why we can fit 50 Kerbals on this thing. No point in inflating them right now unless they... Well, maybe they'll act as a parachute if we fail to get down to the... If we fail to get into orbit. 1700 meters per second... Okay, so just balancing this time to apoapps, trying to make sure that it doesn't drop too quickly. We have about four times as much burn time as we have time to apoapse, so I need to keep this thing off center, and that means we are suffering from steering losses. But that is basically the cosine of the angle between the velocity vector and the thrust vector. So it's actually it starts out pretty good. Okay, let's see if we can hover my time to apoapse at around 10 seconds. Vertical speed is. It's about uh, just under 30 meters per second now. About to pass 2,000, 2,000 meters per second, and we have 200, we just had 280, so, oh, this is going to be like, oh, this is going to be such a, such a small margin for error here. Just keep this going. Okay, 2,100, and my periaps is coming up. We are now just going to plunge into the atmosphere and die slightly more slowly than previously, but soon, soon we will uh, have our periaps above the surface, and good, 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 it's 13, 12, 20, 30, 40, 50, get ready to cut 60, stop! 2284 meters per second, and that is us successfully in orbit, 75 by 71 kilometer orbit, Oh, and exactly zero meters per second of delta V. Wow. <laughs> wow. <laughs> that that was a razor thin margin. There is like no fuel left on this. I, I didn't it had monoprop, but I didn't include uh reaction control thrusters on this thing because I didn't want yeah, I didn't think it needed it because it had reaction uh wheels. Yeah, zero fuel. Well, I guess I'm going to have to come up with some kind of rescue mission for this. It, it is in orbit. We need to get it up to its correct orbit. And so here we go with Operation Demo. Demo is going to have to, well, meet the field and exert some sort of influence over it to get it into orbit. It's going to be the premier supplier for the field. So the first thing we've got to do, obviously, is line up the orbits and then, then at least try to wait until the field is coming by and off we go. This thing, uh, as you can see, properly strutted up. There is no wobbling of these solid rocket boosters. No, they are tied down with as much duct tape as I could find. And uh, yeah, the upper stage spacecraft is pretty simple here. It is a bunch of fuel tanks and a uh, probe to control it, some battery power, and it also has some landing legs because you know what? We could start thinking about reusability here. At least we'll think about it after we've admired that giant uh, booster separation moment there, because that was really quite beautiful. Never mind, that's enough staring. Back to the orbit getting, back to the time accelerating. Yeah, uh, again, I started my gravity turn just a little early there, but we have enough control authority to keep that under, to make that happen. So we're just picking up the speed here, and we're high enough that we don't need to worry about the, about the heating or anything. There we go, Apoapse is 72 kilometers, and we're going to be pretty close. We're going to be within about 100 kilometers when we begin our circularization burn here. So we do have uh, monopropellant for maneuvering here, obviously because we're going to have to perform a dock here. And there we go, we have the, we have the spacecraft showing. A little bit of a burn here, so what I'm trying to do is also incorporate a little bit of an inclination change here to try and minimize the inclination. So the relative inclination is down to like 0.37 degrees. Next, we're finishing off our boost into orbit here and 
I guess I kind of underestimated what I would need. So my vertical speed is dropping. It's actually going negative and pushing us down into the atmosphere. So I start employing the reaction control thrusters to, you know, soften my descent, slow my descent, and accelerate my uh, orbital velocity, hoping that somewhere we will get this thing to orbit before I fall too far into the clutches of the cold and draggy atmosphere. Uh-oh, I feel it! I feel the tenuous claws of the air, the icy fingers of the atmosphere, pulling me down inexorably. But no, they will not have me, for my engines will push me free. I shall thumb my nose at them. Or, I would if I had a nose. Okay. So we're now in orbit. Of course, we need to start making all these corrections. 0.4 degrees is pretty good for a relative inclination, so that's the first thing I'm just going to correct on its own. Oh, there's the rest of my spacecraft. It's uh, 25 kilometers below me now. I'm sure it's having a nice warm time in the atmosphere now. Okay, so we set that up and then we'll time accelerate forwards. And as the time approaches, we sl we return from time warp, only to realize that I haven't put enough batteries on this. So the only battery power I have is on that probe. Therefore, we need to wait until we go around the other side and start thinking about other things to do. Since we've moved about another 90 degrees around the orbit, there's no... Uh, it's not useful for me to try messing with the inclination. Instead, we get to do some circularization. We get to try and lift the periaps up just a bit right now. So that'll help in figuring out the synchronization of these two orbits. Now, normally when they're planning rendezvous maneuvers with the space station, the the spacecraft are following a series of co-elliptic orbits, and that means that the uh, orbits are, have their perihelion and aphelion aligned, right? So the argument of the perihelion and the longitude of the ascending node are both the same for both orbits, and the only thing that's different is the semi-major axis. Now, you might think a well-managed object like the International Space Station would have essentially zero eccentricity, but... If you look at it, if you look at the data for its current orbital elements, there's about 10 kilometer difference between its perihelion or perigee and the apogee. That's a eccentricity of about 0 0.0007 or thereabouts. Anyway, while I'm talking about these coelliptic orbits, that's not what I did here. I just kind of lined up the orbits as best I could and hoped that I got close before uh, nightfall fell. Yeah, this is a, while we're approaching at a leisurely pace of about 12 meters per second, uh, I do start to get worried that if I, if I slow, if I dock too slowly, then the whole thing could go into night time and we might have to drift apart for a little while before I complete the encounter. So again, what I'm doing here most of the time, by the way, is using the the monopropellant thrusters to perform most of the maneuvers because I really want to get the liquid fuel and the oxidizer on board the station because that's what it's actually going to use. I want to make sure it has as much as it can. While it does have monopropellant tanks, that is primarily there as a supply, right? As a storage and supply option for other spacecraft visiting. So we could do that. We could refill its monoprop, but right now we are going to dock and make sure that it gets into its 350 kilometer orbit. And bingo! Bingo, we are successfully here with our rescue spacecraft, and this is a good place for us to leave it. We'll be back with more Galileo Conquest next time. Until then, I'm Scott Manley. Fly safe. <laughs>